Sure. Yeah, and if we want to touch on that just briefly, I know you. So, you guys have been like the in the upfitter for at least one fleet of police cars, right? Is that or or maybe it's more? I guess maybe maybe you want to expound on that a little bit. So, you guys have recently gotten into, I guess, outfitting Teslas for police applications. Then. Yeah, yeah. So um, we got in the news a couple of months ago for um, the world's first 100% police fleet EV changeover all in one go. Okay. Prior to that, there's been like little dabbling then of, you know, a, a fleet, one here, one there, but okay. it's a big leap of faith to replace an entire gasoline uh, fleet with EVs. Uh, and we were involved in that, everything from the sales process, like going to city hall meetings and like, oh, wow. you know, ad- advocating to get funding and like overcoming, you know, the fear, uncertainty and doubt of, people in charge who are asking questions about, you know, what happens if Russia hacks your whole fleet and like cars are like turned into whatever, like there's so many, there's so many fear factor things that like we have to overcome. So we've, we learned a lot on the sales side, um, on the procurement side with Tesla, on the engineering side with understanding the use case challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we ended up, I think, hitting a sweet spot of, you know, approaching the same way that we approached everything else, which is holistically, how do we make the best, usability, reliability, use case scenario for a Tesla and police fleet. And more importantly, how do we do that and have results so the next time it's sold, it's not so scary of a decision to make that choice. Sure. Because economically, by any standard, it saves a lot of money sure. over, over the duration of the car. Like that's pretty easy to understand, but there's still always going to be some fear about whatever excuse they want to have, sure. whether it's sure. charging infrastructure concerns or you know, the crazy comments you see online of, oh, in a police chase, what happens when a Tesla just runs out of battery and the criminal gets away or those, those 300 all, all plus the, all, mile all chases. Nonsense. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, I know it's, it's nonsense, but we have to just like, you know, lead by example and show sure. that this is real and it works. And then it goes from the same idea back in 2013, you know, advocating that driving a Tesla can be fun and enjoyable for someone who didn't give it a shot. Now we got to do the same thing you know, uh, having police fleets with Teslas, people have reasons to believe that's not true uh, or not good. Uh, I know for a fact it is. So we got to just do it, prove it. And then that becomes the new standard. Awesome. So that fleet, how many vehicles then did you guys equip it with? So we're, we just announced the deal. I don't even know, three, four months ago, we're in the middle of it. Uh, that's a smaller fleet. It's 20 cars. Okay. Still, that's um, a good chunk of cars. It, uh, it takes a lot more engineering than I expected okay. to get it dialed in. Uh, much like the aftermarket, how I was saying the pros and cons are that there's no standards. Anyone could do anything. Uh, police fleet upfitting, there's not really any standards. Anyone can do pretty much anything. Okay. So there's, uh, I think, a lot of opportunities to uh, make the vehicles more reliable, uh, safer for officers from a ballistic standpoint, working on ballistic protection options. Oh, wow. Also cool. from, uh, also from like a electrical standpoint, you know, we're, our engineering right now ranges from ballistic stuff to harnesses and electronics to lighting components to uh, uh, everything in between, um, uh, push bars, pit maneuver type stuff, everything in between. We're kind of re-envisioning what we think a, right, a good solution is. Um, and you know, one of the fun things about being a manufacturer is you can make anything better. Sure. Um, you know, there's no rules. Uh, as long as you can find an opportunity to make something better, you can do it. So uh, my mind has been uh, lately uh, ballistic door protection because ballistic doors are laughably bad right now. Uh, yeah, people just weld in thick steel plates historically, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you look at a Tesla, we, we, we installed one. Uh, it adds so much weight that when you close the door, the car shakes for like 20 seconds. Uh, you know, in officer use cases, they're usually not on flat ground. So if they're ducking behind that door on a hill, that thing's crushing them because it's really heavy. Uh, and also the Tesla doors, the windows are frameless. And I guarantee you that door sacks yeah. uh, over time and sure. that window starts contacting and things break. Uh, anyway, as, as an example of how aftermarket should work, and I think it does work in most cases, you can identify opportunities everywhere, whether sure. it's a brake pad compound, whether it's a ballistic door, whether it's aerodynamic opportunities, uh, everything's fair game in our world, and that's fun. Sure. Now, on the topic of new use cases, I know I'm, I'm curious. So we talked a bit about racing, I, and I know obviously on your guys' site there's a section for Cybertruck. It's a different vehicle than other vehicles they've had <laughs> out. Are we going to see like an unplugged performance Cybertruck at the Dakar Rally or something in the near future? Are there 
what sort of racing applications might you guys be considering for Cybertruck? Uh, I'd love to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, sky's the limit with Cybertruck. There's so much that can be done. Our initial focus is rethinking the Cybertruck the same way that we rethink any vehicle, which is starting foundationally with the DNA of it and making it more of that. So the DNA of Cybertruck is not a, it's not a race truck. So our initial focus is not about racing, although the platform will be very capable for racing and we'll have a lot of crossover on the stuff we're doing with motorsports because uh, ultimately anything that is more uh, ruggedized, more adjustable, you know, uh, specialized for different use cases will transfer into racing anyways. But our general ethos for Cybertruck is, you know, if you had to be in one vehicle, you know, in an apocalypse or like end of the world or Mars or somewhere else, like this is like the most badass, indestructible thing you'd want to be in. Sure. And it ends up being just like a Swiss Army knife of you can do anything and you can do it in the most ruggedized way possible. So our ethos is more of that, please. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to do more of that. Super neat. Well, I know, I'm sure you guys will acquire your own and rapidly disassemble them to figure everything out. That's our same thing too. I can promise you as soon as we can get our hands on a cyber truck, we'll be tearing it apart and putting it on the channel and everything. So if there's ever anything we can do in terms of giving you an advanced look, I'm sure you're probably like, I think I have a reservation in for a cyber truck. I'm like 17,000th in line or something. So not very <laughs> early, but uh, hopefully everyone's pretty eager. Yeah. I think it'll be worth the wait though. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, hey, man, this has been super fun. I think we're probably, I want to be respectful of your time and make sure we kind of don't run on for, for forever here. But uh, maybe we could end with one last uh, kind of big question or, or thought. I guess there are some people, and you alluded to it earlier, I, I've, I've heard people say that EVs are like the, the death of car culture. They're going to steal the spirit of, of cars as we've known them. And I would imagine that that comment uh, you have a different opinion there. I guess if someone if someone came up to you and, and said that, they said that, you know, EVs aren't good for car culture, what would your message to them be? Yeah, yeah that was that was the driving focus when we started. Uh, it was very simply, we drove the car, we knew it was the future, and the question was, is this the death of car culture or the beginning of a new chapter? Mm -hmm. And every action we've done for the past 10 years has been to show that it's the beginning of a new chapter. And I think... What we've seen is quite the opposite, which is that most most standard people judge car culture. It's hard to be competitive if you're not an EV. Um, you know, the we have in, in multiple cases with our Model S the overall uh, lap record of any car. We're not competing against EVs. We're competing against everything. Sure. Um, so I think from an enthusiast standpoint, uh, we're reaching a point where the fastest cars, definably fastest cars, have to be EV or at least hybrid. But in, in the future, 100% EV, not not hybrid. Um, I think from a community standpoint, we see these car shows, gatherings are getting bigger and bigger. People are enjoying different ways to customize their cars. And uh, there's more of a duality of use. It used to be that if you modify the car, you made it worse of a daily driver. And then you had to get a second daily driver to have your modified car in the garage for the weekends. Sure. The Tesla as a platform doesn't piss off your neighbors during cold starts in the mornings on the weekends. <laughs> uh, you know, it's... You can enjoy your audio system because it's not making a bunch of noise all the time. You know, for normal uh, gasoline powered cars, not normal, but for ice cars, you'd have, you know, uh, valve exhaust systems where you can kind of have a little bit of peace and quiet, but not too much. Tesla is just good at everything. Uh, so there's not really a downside. The only, the only argument that can be made uh, is there will be some nostalgia for analog. And I think that's totally okay. I think ultimately, you know, uh, uh, a lot of car enthusiasts' future garages will be a Tesla for every day and an old lightweight analog car that has no electronics just to counterbalance that for weekends. Because driving a Tesla, if anything, it makes you appreciate imperfect, inefficient things because the Tesla is so efficient and so perfect that you almost sometimes want to experience the noise and the rattle and like the long throw shifts and all the quirks and clutches and all yeah. these things just because that's also an experience. You know, that's horseback riding, right? Like this is yeah. where we're at is, you know, we've, we've made a, a cultural leap. Yeah, I know. And I was like, yeah, the, for the same reason people have record players or any other old nostalgic thing will blow the dust off the stick shift and, uh, you know, show your kids how to drive it someday. It'll be the, the relic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I totally respect that. But I think anyone who loves cars and loves driving every day, if they haven't already realized that driving an EV checks so many more boxes than they thought was possible. 
I think those days are coming for for everyone, and it's not it's not like a you have to. It's a you'll you'll want to once sure. you realize how good it is. 